Hello and welcome to Views from the Market, Mid-Market Private Equity and M&A in Canada. My name is Mario Negro. I'm a partner at Steichman Elliott in the Private Equity M&A Group. For today's podcast, I'd like to welcome our special guest, Jennifer Chasson. Jennifer is the founder and president of Springbank Capital. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Mario. Jennifer, I'd like to, to uh, start by talking a little bit about yourself. You are a, a, a deal junkie like the rest of us. You've been in the market a long, <laughs> a long time. Uh, so I, you got a lot of, lot of history. Uh, uh, still young, no less, but a lot of history. So maybe we start a little bit about, about learning a little bit about yourself and, and, and Springbank. Fantastic. Sure. So um, I started my career at, uh, well, I'll take a step back. I'm born and raised in Toronto. I did a degree in marketing and minored in accounting and then decided to pursue my CA designation, which I did with Coopers and Librand. The moment I got my time completed for audit, I moved right into corporate finance, which is where I began my career in M&A, uh, starting in due diligence and sort of learned from the ground up from some very smart people. Uh, from there, I spent about five years at Roynat Capital, which is where I cut my teeth in finance. Um, and it was sort of a nice marriage between my marketing degree and my CA, mixing the uh, sales and uh, that type of work together with my accounting and finance. Um, then I decided to pursue my CBV, Chartered Business Valuator designation, um, and joined uh, BDO uh, during that undertaking. And in 2004, I took the bold step of uh, taking my practice out by myself. Um, which was a very exciting, scary time, but I've never looked back. Um, at that point, it was Chase and Financial. In 2013, I yeah, sort of linked my wagon together with Zeifman's, a large market accounting firm, um, and we renamed the firm Springbank Capital Corp. Um, Springbank Capital, tell you a little bit about uh, the shop. We're a boutique corporate finance advisory firm with three primary services that we offer. The predominant one, or sort of about 70% of the practice, is mergers and acquisitions, uh, how you and I know one another. We cross paths continually on transactions. Um, I also raise capital as well as I do business valuation um, for corporate finance and tax purposes and some lit light. Uh, I don't focus on litigation at all, corporate finance. And as you said, a bit of a deal junkie. I've um, been doing this for about 25 years now um, with about 100 deals or so under my belt. Um, and over the last 10 years, many of them with you, Mario. <laughs> And, and Jennifer, I know, I mean, obviously, uh, Springbank focuses on sell side mandates. And um, I know you've been active uh, in this market like the rest of us. I wanted to get your perspective on, uh, on what you're seeing in the market, what your experience has been, you know, particularly with, with COVID and, and all that's going on and get your thoughts on uh, how your practice has uh, developed over the last few years in this uh, kind of crazy time. It really has been a crazy time. Um, just to give a little color on, on sort of niche in the market that we focus on, we're in the lower mid market alongside you. Um, we focus on entrepreneurs and family businesses of at least a million dollars of EBITDA. A lot of my clients tend to be in the old economy with some, uh, you know, I just closed the transaction for lean industries. So it's a fintech deal. So I definitely step outside of the old economy type businesses. But my mainstay tends to be manufacturing, distribution, business services to get sort of put some parameters on uh, the types of deals that we focus on. And COVID during this time, what I found to be a lot of haves and companies that have done it extremely well, and then you've got the have-nots that have struggled under uh, the pandemic. Um, at Springbank, 
we've seen a ton of deals. Uh, we've done about $250 million worth of transactions in the last year and a half, um, which has been extraordinary. Um, we typically do about three deals a year. And so it's been extremely robust. I think one of some of the challenges, well, it, it, in terms of the market, if I take one step back, probably spring and summer of 2021 was the craziest, uh, busiest time I've ever seen in the marketplace over the 25 years that I've been doing this. And I think it was a mix of a few things. One, uh, in the U.S., a lot of companies were selling because they weren't sure what Biden was going to do with the capital gains taxes, and many wanted to cash out before then. Um, and the marketplace was heating up even before. There was a stall for a short, short period when people weren't sure where multiples would be and what was going to be in the marketplace. Um, but we still saw a ton of activity. Uh, we even brought a deal to market in June of 2020, sort of just four months in. One of the challenges I think some of the buyers were having is valuation, how much of the uh, growth that many of these companies were enjoying was a COVID bump and how much was sustainable. I, I think that was one of the one of the challenges that a lot of buyers were working through. Um, at the end of the day, it didn't impact multiples. Multiples were very far they threw out, and they continue to be. I think the marketplace has calmed down since that time. It was quite at a peak, but it's still really active today. Can I ask you, Jennifer? You you highlighted something I've noticed too, and I wanted to get your thoughts on the old economy. The old for all the talk about tech and, <laughs> and the new economy, it seems as though in the last couple of years the old economy is back. There is an oh, interest yeah. in old school companies, manufacturing. Um, you know, you know HVAC, tool and die, uh, yeah. company, businesses that you couldn't sell. Honestly, you could not sell them five or ten years. Nobody wanted them. Uh, and I wanted to get your thoughts on why you think that's the case, given, you know, you're on the front end of it. You're seeing it. why the interest in the old economy in a way that, you know, uh, su uh, surprised me, uh, but it's great to see. Uh, uh, get your thoughts on that, why the old economy is popular and seems to have made a comeback. You know what? I've always lived and breathed in this space from my Roynet days that tended, that focused on these and just on old economy uh, businesses. But I think in part, it's, it's not moving at lightning speed. So people can keep up with it and understand it. There's stability there. I think they get comfort from the um, stabilize the stable growth instead of the rocket that people aren't sure is going to be there the next day. Um, you know, it's bags, bottles, people are going to need, uh, you know, their soap bottles and shampoo bottles or soup jars every day of every week of every year. It's like when garbage was the craze with PEs. There was a, a lot of shopping in that space. People are going to put their garbage out of their end of their driveway <laughs> every week. It, it you, you, can't, you, can't, yeah, you can't dematerialize garbage. <laughs> no, but, but seriously, it's, yeah, you know, yeah. it's not a pretty business. It's not a sexy business, but it's, it's stable. It's good cash flow and continues to grow. And, and there's something to be said for that when you've got various bubbles that you can ride up and also have pop and, and fall off the edge. So um, it depends on what type of investor you are. They've got some people, you know, there's many investors that don't want to put uh, money into equipment and machinery um, and shy away from capital intensive businesses. And then you got others that really like it and feel that they've at least got some hard assets behind it, something they can touch and feel. So the universe may not be, or buyer universe may not be quite as large for those industries they are strong um, and there's a definite active market for it. What, one of the things I've noticed, Tony, your thoughts, Jennifer, your, your practice is that the, 
you know, the, you know, for all the talk about the increased multiples, um, it hasn't just been for tech or for food or for the kind of, you know, the superstar spaces that have attracted, but even the old economy businesses seem to have had a bit of a resurgence in terms of multiples, even they're getting some of the, maybe it's the tide that lifts all boats, but I wanted yeah. to get your, your thoughts on if you're noticing that too. Cause I, and I think you said some of it before that the fact that they had, you know, were able to have stable EBITDA during these years has made them more attractive. But I wanted to get your perspective on why you're seeing the old economy companies who frankly years ago couldn't get much on multiples seem to themselves now be getting increased multiples as well. Most definitely. And I think part of it is, is you know, old is the new sexy. Um, yeah, I, it, you know, I, I think there's a there's a, a lot of comfort in it and confidence in it, and that confidence is enabling them to bring the valuations up um, because there's competition for it, as well as bankers, you know, the lenders. You're able to get a little more leverage on this. Again, long history, stable marketplaces. They can understand the marketplace. Um, and it adds a, a level of comfort that enables them to stretch a little to uh, secure the transaction. And you definitely see uh, buyers needing to stretch as the valuations have been strong. And, and I'm curious, I mean, in terms of the, the type of buyers in the old economy, is it is it a new breed, is it same buyer, different buyers than in the past? Are you seeing more people come to the old economy type businesses, the manufacturings, the the production type businesses, uh, um, are you seeing new type of buyers or is it just the amplifying of the people that were already there? I think it's more an amplification of the groups that were already there. A um, lot of private equity, um, whereas before they were looking at transactions that only had a much higher level of EBITDA as in 10 to 15 million is a minimum came downstream a little because they're feeling the, the they're, they can buy better value at uh, those sizes and enough of them have joined this space, which is dropping the multiples up in, in, the, in this band or snack bracket now. I think that's part of it. Um, and there's just more entering or having an interest in uh, old economy. When, but you know what I mean? Many of them came to that space, right? So looking for, you know, the valuations got so frothy on the 10 plus million EBITDA companies. They're thinking, you know, I can do a little better in the maybe in the five to seven, eight, 10 million EBITDA companies. Agreed. And so, enough of them joined that, that snack bracket that it started to drive the valuations up there too, I think was part. No, I, I, I agree. There's, there's definitely a greater interest in these old economy type businesses, because even though the multiples may have gone up, I've noticed that they're still more reasonable than paying, you know, 15 or 14 times, or you could still get a deal done at a reasonable multiple where a seller's happy, a buyer's happy, good bank financing. And so the value proposition, I think for these has become much more attractive particularly because the valuations, even though they've gone up, haven't gone up as crazy as, some other spaces. Um, Agreed. Yeah, yeah. I, I also think, um, I mean, your thoughts, but one of the things I'm noticing in buyers in those old economy businesses is um, uh, that you said it's the new sexy, it's 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 the new tech business. They, I think a lot of the buyers are seeing these old economy businesses as ones that they can add a lot of uh, innovation to. And so... <laughs> They, they could turn them into something that maybe the seller didn't see, but they, they could, you know, they can really uh, drive certain value. But I want to see if you're see, noticing that too, in terms of the way the buyers look at these businesses. Absolutely. Um, because you've got, you know, a lot of these older economy businesses are being sold for, by people that may not be as tech savvy. And you've got uh, new buyers coming into this space that are looking at the business and looking at how they can, uh, bring technology to improve overall margins. I, it was just at a plant tour today, and that the entire discussion revolved around um, moving from manual to more robotic, moving uh, ERP systems to be able to get more granular and drive margin. You're seeing a lot of that. Are you uh, noticing 
Jamfer, in terms of uh, as as the multiples for these old economy businesses have gone up, like other sectors, are you seeing the need to kind of bridge gaps, or or the need to, to you know, is is purchase price being influenced by you know earnouts, promissory notes, other other vehicles to kind of bridge valuation back uh, valuation gaps in this sector, like some of the others, or is this still kind of you know the one thing about the old economy? It, had, it used to it used to be a cleaner deal, you know, cash on closing was king, you know, was queen, was king, you know. Um, yeah. Are you seeing some of that as the valuations go up in this sector too? That's a great question. And we are seeing a little bit more of that. Whereas before it was a clean deal. Um, here's your purchase price. Well, there may be a little structure with possibly a VTB. Um, it was a, a simple clean close with a number. Um, today, you're seeing a little bit more uh, structuring to a deal with some earnouts, and it, it's something I've been thinking a little bit more on as to what's driving that. Is it some of the uncertainty today in the marketplace with the continued growth to bridge that value gap? Um, some of it is project based that's driving some of that uh, structuring, but. Um, in large part, I, I think it's because some of them have achieved a lot more growth in the last couple of years, and they're trying to balance out what is the COVID bump and what isn't, and uh, to bridge through that piece. As one side will say it's sustainable, and the other one is I'm not sure if I'm ready to pay for that sustainability because we haven't gotten through the pandemic as yet. I mean, I, I always ask a kind of crystal ball question uh, about where the market's going and where you see it going. And I, I want to ask the same of you, given where you're at uh, and, and the successful year you've had in 2021. What, what are your, where do you see the market going? Do you, do you think we'll continue with this kind of uh, strong pace of deal activity? Any factors you see affecting that? I want to get a sense from you um, on, on where you see this all going. I absolutely think it's going to be continue. It's going to continue to be strong, if not accelerate. I think many people after getting through this whole COVID period are tired. Um, and it's I, the, many, many people I'm speaking to are saying they're getting ready to retire. I think it's going to create a lot of opportunity for search funds. I, I think it's going to create opportunity in the large corporations for the millennials to move up the food chain in uh, their careers as the older people are, I say older people, uh, the people that are closer to retirement um, are tired and uh, choosing to retire and wanting to do something different. The pandemic has shone a light on things. Um, and I, I believe in from what I'm seeing is um, one, causing people to want more than uh, just their work life. They're looking for a little more. They're seeing life being a little shorter and looking for a little more sweetness in their day to day. Well, I look forward to uh, uh, doing some more deals together. I want to thank you for, for joining us today. It's, it's, been, it's been great to have you and to get your perspective. And uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Mario. I appreciate it. Have a great day.